uh, all of uh, your um, presence today. And uh, I will open up with uh, four minutes, uh, a four minute uh, introduction, and, and then uh, uh, we'll re recognize the uh, ranking member for five minutes. Um, I, I am very, uh, I'm very much uh, interested in this topic. Um, I started out my political career uh, as a member of the Kansas City City Council, and I served uh, at my second term on the City Council as the chair of the Planning and Zoning Committee. Uh, and of course, uh, that's where I learned uh, uh, about human beings uh, uh, when you start dealing with zoning. Uh, and right now, uh, we still have what we had back in the 1980s when I chaired the Planning and Zoning Committee in Kansas City, and that is uh, everybody wanted uh, everything that could be brought into a city just not near their own home. Uh, and that created all kinds of problems, including problems of affordability. And right now, the, house of, the, the price of housing uh, is a national crisis, and many observers and experts believe this is worse than it has been uh, at uh, at any point in our, in our history. Uh, if you look at the data from the Census Bureau uh, and the Housing and Urban Development Department in August of uh, uh, this year, the median sale price uh, of new residential homes in the United States was about $390,000, uh, $390,000. Uh, now that is an all time national high. Uh, the price of housing has been uh, put, pu pushed upward and uh, up, upward pressure on rents and, uh, you know, the, the dream of home ownership uh, has, of course, moved further and further away from the majority of the, the people who are, who are now not home owners. And so across the, the entire country, uh, you know, we're, we're having problems. Uh, and uh, if you look at uh, our first responders, uh, they, they can no longer afford to live in the communities they protect uh, because uh, far too many uh, teachers and firefighters and police officers uh, cannot afford to pay the real estate um, uh, price uh, in, in where they're living. Only one of the country's largest 50 metro areas, uh, Pittsburgh, requires less than 30% of a, a starting teacher salary for housing. Uh, from uh, from uh, an, an economic lens, uh, the affordable housing crisis is a supply and demand problem. The supply of housing, uh, and particularly affordable housing, uh, has not kept pace with uh, the, the demand. Uh, data from the United States Census Bureau and HUD also demonstrate that the, that the most recent decade extending from January 2010 through November 2019 saw fewer housing units started than any, this is terrible, any decade uh, since at least the 1960s by a wide margin. And while the, the housing market is uh, desperate uh, and desperately in need of, of more new homes, the development of new homes uh, uh, in the lower end of the market uh, for uh, low income and first time home buyers has become uh, particularly uh, grim. Uh, and so, um, you know, we will uh, get into this a, a lot uh, more as we move along, uh, but I'd like to uh, now recognize uh, the um, a ranking member uh, for five minutes and uh, Mr. Hill. Well, thank you, uh, Chairman Cleaver. Thanks for convening this hearing. I appreciate the leadership of the chairwoman and uh, ranking member McHenry as well. Poor local zoning practices, especially in our largest cities in the country are among the many government regulations that make it more expensive to find a place to live in the United States. Hearing after hearing in this committee, we've heard how housing affordability is ultimately about housing supply. There's simply more people that want to buy a home or rent an apartment than there are homes available. The same applies to the rental market. 
artificial barriers and certain, certain local zoning policies can make it even more difficult and expensive to build new houses or apartments, impeding the kind of market-driven behavior between buyers and sellers that could help bring the cost of housing down. Imposing new government mandates like inclusionary zoning and rent control or increasing federal housing assistance to subsidize down payments really doesn't do anything to address that underlying supply and demand imbalance in many markets. They just uh, instead shift the cost of building new housing units to residents through higher rents, taxes, and federal subsidies. Instead, I believe we should be looking at ways to incentivize localities with high housing demand to produce more units and make it easier and less expensive to build housing across that development process, from permitting to planning to construction. If home ownership is a bipartisan goal, then we ought to be looking at how housing regulations are making home ownership more unattainable for thousands of Americans in both rural and urban areas. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today the ways the federal government can help ease some of these local regulatory and zoning barriers to lower the cost of building new housing units and address some of the root causes related to housing supply. I thank my friend from Kansas City for his leadership, and I'm proud here in, in central Arkansas to represent a, uh, a market where the median home price here is $156,800. We're at about $101 a square foot. Our property taxes are 0.68%. And so we invite all of America to move to central Arkansas where housing is affordable, uh, both for rental purposes and purchase purposes. And again, I think you do have to approach this and you know this as a mayor, uh, my leader, uh, about how it really is essential to give access. And I thought your discussion about uh, different zoning characteristics on multifamily, small order scale versus single family only is of course constructive, but it's a complicated issue and I look forward to the testimony today. I yield back to you. Yeah, thanks for your infomercial, uh, Mr. Ranking Member. Uh, we will now recognize the chair of the full committee, uh, Maxine Waters from California. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. This is very important. In America today, our zip code preordains our access to jobs, home ownership, affordable rent, and a child's access to quality education. It began with enslaving and later segregating my ancestors, stripping our indigenous brothers and sisters from their land, redlining people of color out of home ownership, and it continues today with restrictive and exclusionary zoning policies. Communities across this country continue to use zoning and local control as a dog whistle to preserve racial residential segregation that contributes to the undersupply of housing. We must ensure every family in America has access to the communities of their choice. So I look forward to our expert witnesses for their testimony today. Again, I thank you for holding this hearing and I yield back the balance of my time. Yo back. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, for your uh, comments today. Uh, we now welcome the testimony of our uh, distinguished witnesses. First, we have Cheryl D. Cashin, Carmack Waterhouse Professor of Law, Civil Rights, and Social Justice from Georgetown University. Next, we have Richard D. Kallenberg, a senior fellow from the Century Foundation. Next, we have Dora Leon Gallo, President and CEO of Community of Friends. And then we have Thomas Silverman, Silverstein, I'm sorry, Associate Director of Fair Housing and Community Development Project, Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. And finally, we have Dr. Emily Ham uh, Hamilton, Senior Research Fellow and Coordinator of the uh, Urbanity Project at the Marcactus Center, George Mason University. University. Uh, witnesses are reminded that their oral testimony will be limited to five minutes. You should be able to see a timer on your screen that will indicate how much time you have left and chime will uh, will go off uh, at the end of your time. 
Um, I would like to ask that you be mindful of the timer and quickly wrap up your testimony if you hear the chime or that we can be so that we can be respectful of both witnesses and uh, the committee's time. So uh, we will now hear from uh, Ms. Uh, Cheryl D. Cashin. You have five minutes. Thank you very much. I want to uh, begin by associating myself with the comments of the August chairwoman and my comments are in that spirit. I've spent nearly three decades grappling with US segregation and how it produces racial inequality. My most recent book, White Space, Black Hood, Opportunity Hoarding and Segregation in the Age of Inequality reflects this decades of examination. It argues that we have a system of residential caste in which government overinvests and excludes in affluent white spaces and disinvests and contains and frankly preys on people in high poverty black neighborhoods. These are the extremes of American residential caste, but everyone who cannot afford to buy their way into high opportunity neighborhoods is harmed by this system. The poor especially are systematically excluded from opportunity for social mobility, no matter how hard they work to escape. Exclusionary zoning was first sanctioned by the US Supreme Court in 1926, in which it endorsed the idea that even duplexes were parasitic, I quote, on single family homes and the people who live there. In ensuing decades, thousands of new suburban governments formed enabling middle class and upper class whites to wield the zoning power to exclude certain types of housing, particularly rental apartments, and therefore exclude unwelcome populations. Fast forward to today, and where high levels of black segregation persist, researchers have found that it was actively promoted by zoning laws that restricted density and by high levels of anti-black prejudice. According to a stunning geographically mapped analysis recently produced by the New York Times, it is illegal on 75% of the residential land in many American cities to build anything other than a detached single family home. That figure is even higher in many suburbs and newer suburban belt cities. A recent study released by an institute at UC Berkeley found that we're getting worse. About 81% of large and medium metro areas were more segregated in 2019 than they were in 1990. The most persistent type of neighborhoods today are affluent white spaces and concentrated poverty neighborhoods. And the boundaries of these neighborhoods is hardening. That means it's harder to get into places of high opportunity. And frankly, it is harder to get out of the hood. The past and present of federally backed segregation policies inform the legal and moral case for congressional action to disrupt exclusionary zoning. I cover that history quickly in my written testimony. Suffice to say, uh, intentional segregation of black people in the 20th century shaped living patterns for everyone. The infrastructure for maintaining segregation lives on. Racial steering by realtors, discrimination in mortgage lending, exclusionary zoning, government subsidized affordable housing that concentrates poverty, local school boundaries that encourage segregation, plus continued resistance to racial integration by many Americans. So in considering policy options, please first acknowledge that the main reason exclusionary zoning persists is the vested interest and expectations of people who live in poverty-free havens. In so-called blue California, where Democrats are in charge, despite a grave housing and homelessness crisis, the state was only able to take the baby step of opening single family neighborhoods to duplexes. If Congress wants to disrupt a near century of exclusionary zoning, serious pressure and accountability are required. I recommend not just spending incentives to repeal exclusionary zoning, but uh, pressure on localities to adopt well-designed inclusionary zoning ordinances, the best example of which is the highly successful mandatory ordinance of Montgomery 
County, Maryland. This extremely diverse, wealthy suburban county has no pockets of concentrated poverty and poor children have more access. Men that federal housing, community development and infrastructure funds should be conditioned on localities adopting inclusionary zoning ordinances that actually affirmatively further fair housing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Cashin, for your uh, testimony. Uh, we now recognize Mr. Uh, Kallenberg from the uh, Senior Fellow at the Century Foundation. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Cleaver, uh, Chairwoman Waters, Ranking Member Hill, and all the members of the subcommittee. Uh, thank you for holding this important hearing on exclusionary zoning. Uh, I'm Richard Kallenberg, Senior Fellow at the Century Foundation, where I conduct research on housing and education policy. It's my testimony that local zoning policies that prohibit multifamily dwellings are driving up housing prices, fueling racial and economic segregation, and limiting the opportunity for millions of children and families to achieve the American dream. There is much that Congress can do to fix this, including adopting a new Economic Fair Housing Act, uh, which I will discuss in a moment. I call local exclusionary policies uh, the walls we don't see because they are less visible to the public than other forms of discrimination. Most Americans today understand that it was wrong uh, for white mobs to scream at young black children trying to attend desegregated schools in the South in the 1960s. Many of us know the uh, Norman Rockwell painting of Ruby Bridges, a small black child who had to be escorted by large FBI agents to our elementary school in New Orleans because white people objected to her presence based on the color of her skin. Uh, but in 2021, local governments continue to erect less visible walls that keep low income and working class families, many of them families of color, from living in safe neighborhoods with good schools. Uh, as Professor Cashin noted, in most American cities, zoning laws prohibit uh, the construction of relatively affordable homes, duplexes, triplexes, quads, and larger family units uh, on three quarters of residential land. There are millions of modern day uh, Ruby Bridges whose lives are hurt by exclusionary zoning. I interviewed, for example, Chiara Cornelius, a low wage single mother who a few, few years ago was living in South Columbus, Ohio, and was looking for better schools and a safer neighborhood for her kids. She, so, she told me that she did not allow her children to walk to the grandmother's house just a couple of blocks away because it was dangerous to do so. She drove them instead. Now, one might look at Cornelius's predicament and say that her exclusion from better opportunities was simply a reflection of the workings of the free market and housing. But in Columbus suburbs, spans on construction of duplexes, triplexes, and apartment buildings keep people like Cornelius zoned out by government fiat. So what can be done? In my written testimony, I discovered a number of possible reforms, including the committee's Unlocking Possibilities program, uh, which would represent one of the most significant federal efforts to curtail exclusionary zoning in decades and deserve strong uh, support. But federal carrots should be supplemented by federal sticks to add heft to the effort uh, at, by the way, a much more modest cost than incentive programs. In particular, Congress should create a private right of action comparable to the one found in the 1968 Fair Housing Act to allow victims of economically discriminatory government zoning policies to sue in federal court, just as victims of racial discrimination currently can. I call this proposal an Economic Fair Housing Act. The original 1968 Fair Housing Act was a monumental advance for human freedom and helped produce a 30% decline in black-white residential segregation since 1970. But at the same time, income segregation has more than doubled during this period. Part of the problem, as Harvard's Michael Sandel has noted, is that highly educated elites may denounce racism and sexism, but are unapologetic about their negative attitudes towards the less educated. Now, for important historical reasons, being a class snob is not held in the same disrepute, uh, disrepute as being a racist. But in the context of the same 
Black families and working class families of all races are, are held in such low regard uh, that the state is somehow justified in sponsoring laws that make it illegal for anyone to build the types of housing these families can afford. An Economic Fair Housing Act would make clear that economic discrimination is wrong, whether or not it has a disparate impact on people of color, but the act would also reduce racial segregation by helping low-income plaintiffs of color who now face stiff evidentiary burdens under disparate impact law to prevail in court. Uh, once again, thank you for this opportunity to discuss the ways uh, to reduce barriers that artificially separate Americans and hurt our country. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we will hear from Ms. Dora Leon Gallo, President and CEO of Community of Friends. Ms. Gallo. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the subcommittee and Chairwoman Walters. Thank you for this opportunity to testify today. My name is Dora Leon Gallo and I am the President and CEO of Community of Friends. We're a nonprofit affordable housing development corporation based out of California with a very specific mission of ending homelessness for people um, individuals and families affected by mental illness. In the past 33 years, we've completed 51 apartment buildings throughout Los Angeles and Orange County, including two buildings in San Diego County. And currently, we operate 43 buildings housing over 2,500 individuals, uh, including over 600 children. As a nonprofit organization serving people with disabilities, I have seen firsthand how government regulation and control of land use through a, zoning pro through a process called zoning, can be used to both stimulate or slow down the development in communities and or used to exclude certain people and populations from living in certain communities. And although local government's authority to regulate land use is granted by state governments, the development of affordable housing has inherently been a local process. For decades, zoning was controlled at the neighborhood level. But this trend has been changing, giving the crisis many communities face with lack of affordable housing. And in the context of building supportive housing to end homelessness, a community of friends have often encountered um, opposition from community members using zoning and discretionary approvals to block housing for people experiencing homelessness who are disproportionately people of color. So for instance, in Los Angeles, 40 percent of those who are homeless are black, yet black people make up only 9 percent of L.A. County's population. Discrimination against people with mental illness are repeatedly couched in land use terms. This housing project is too dense. It's too out of character with the neighborhood. It has insufficient parking and it'll generate traffic. Cities frequently bow to the pressure to preserve the status quo, leading to continued discriminatory practices and continued racial inequities in housing. California's environmental review process further challenges supportive housing projects. California has the California Environmental Quality Act, known as CEQA, which was intended to analyze and mitigate the environmental harm of public projects. But it has been weaponized over the past decade to delay or stop affordable and supportive housing projects that require government approvals. Twice in 2018, a community of friends faced legal challenges on environmental grounds for two supportive housing projects for veterans that we proposed, even when on one project only 49 units were proposed in a site zone for over 100 units. We prevailed in both lawsuits, but the result was an almost four year delay on each project, a significant increase in costs as funding commitments were deobligated and construction costs increased and dozens of homeless individuals and families, including veterans, were not able to access this affordable housing with on-site supportive services that the two projects could have provided. The federal government has a role to play in zoning reform. HUD should continue researching regulatory barriers and advancing solutions to overcome them. HUD's Regulatory Bar Barriers Clearinghouse is a valuable resource for identification of barriers and solutions to housing production and preservation. HUD should also continue its implementation of affirmatively furthering fair housing regulation and develop programs using a carrot and stick approach to ensure compliance with this provision of the Fair Housing Act of 1968. Congress also has a pivotal role to play. The Build Back Better plan pending before Congress includes the Unlocking Possibilities Zoning Program, which was just previously mentioned. This grant program will incentivize local governments to improve housing strategies reform zoning practices and streamline local regulations. 
It would be particularly useful to small communities that may lack the resources capacity to conduct housing needs assessments and to develop those concrete steps necessary to eliminate barriers to produce affordable housing and advance fair housing. Additionally, Congress should propose legislation or regulations that link federal funding to affirmatively furthering fair housing rules. Consider federal legislation to prohibit state and local governments from putting roadblocks in the way of increasing affordable housing and fostering inclusive communities and make rental assistance universally available to households in need and to prohibit source of income discrimination. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I look forward to your questions. Thank, thank you, Ms. Gallo. Thank you very much. Um, now we will have uh, uh, Thomas Silverstein, the Associate Director of Fair Housing and Community Development uh, Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. Thank you. Uh, Chairwoman Waters, Chairman Cleaver, Ranking Member Hill, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today regarding the harmful impact of exclusionary zoning, as well as strategies for mitigating those harms. My name is Thomas Silverstein, and I am the Associate Director of the Fair Housing and Community Development Project at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. The Lawyers Committee is a national civil rights organization created at the request of President John F. Kennedy in 1963 to mobilize the private bar to confront issues of racial discrimination. Exclusionary zoning is a widespread practice that plays a significant role in the perpetuation of residential racial and economic segregation and the housing affordability crisis. Although high cost coastal metropolitan areas garner the lion's share of the attention in conversations about exclusionary zoning it is a nationwide problem and some of the country's most extreme zoning restrictions are found in suburban jurisdictions in the Midwest and the Deep South. When we talk about exclusionary zoning, it is important that we be precise in our language. Although the roots of modern zoning are unquestionably in early 20th century attempts to segregate communities, not all zoning restrictions are exclusionary in practice. Indeed, some, such as provisions that prevent heavy polluting industrial facilities from being sited near homes, can be salutary. For others, including residential density restrictions, the context matters. Essentially, if such restrictions are preventing low-income people of color from moving to an area with high housing costs, then those restrictions are exclusionary. If, however, notwithstanding similar restrictions, an area is racially and ethnically diverse and housing costs are within reach for low-income households, those same restrictions are not perpetuating exclusion in practice. This distinction has ramifications for the policy debate about zoning at the federal, state, and local levels. Working in collaboration with a broad coalition of civil rights, community organizing, and affordable housing groups brought together by the Alliance for Housing Justice, we developed a set of eight principles to guide federal action around exclusionary zoning. We recommend that federal action, one, focus on areas that are actually exclusionary, two, require an equity analysis to increase impact and avoid unintended consequences, three, prioritize the development of deed-restricted affordable housing, including units for extremely low-income households, four, evaluate municipality zoning and land use actions holistically, five, protect tenants from displacement, six, ensure that historically disinvested communities of color have equitable access to federal funds, seven, identify funding sources that will actually incentivize meaningful change, and eight, obligate municipalities to maintain data and report on their progress. Most recent proposals for federal action around exclusionary zoning have involved carrots rather than sticks, and for such proposals, these pr principles are particularly important. With that said, a more forceful approach may be warranted due to the fact that the municipalities with the most exclusionary zoning are among those least likely to currently receive or to heavily rely upon federal funds. Because zoning regulation and indeed residential construction activity are forms of economic activity that clearly have significant effects on interstate commerce, Congress's power to act is likewise clear. Additionally, the federal government has a strong interest in stopping exclusionary zoning from undermining both the efficiency and the efficacy of its investments in affordable housing development. While Congress determines how to address the problem of exclusionary zoning comprehensively, Congress should urge the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and the U.S. Department of Justice to make better use of their existing powers. HUD, through both its Fair Housing Act enforcement role and its power as a grant administrator, can already take action to reduce exclusionary zoning by filing secretary-initiated discrimination complaints and by holding up localities block grant funds over dubious civil rights certifications, including those involving affirmatively furthering fair housing. DOJ has a special statutorily defined role in investigating and bringing enforcement action under the Fair Housing Act to end exclusionary zoning. DOJ 
is more powerfully situated than our private plaintiffs to bring suit because it does not face the same barriers to establishing standing. Although there have been several successful lawsuits challenging exclusionary zoning over the years, standing doctrine has been the primary reason why such cases have not been more frequent and is therefore the reason why the Fair Housing Act has not had as much of a deterrent effect as it should. The Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law and the Alliance for Housing Justice stand ready to serve as resources to the subcommittee as it contemplates federal action to address the critical problem of exclusionary zoning. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, and now, Ms. Hamilton, you are now recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation of your testimony. Thank you, Chairwoman Waters, Chairman Cleaver, Ranking Member Hill, and members of the subcommittee. I'm Emily Hamilton, a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, where I'm co-director of the Urbanity Project. My remarks today will focus on three points. First, as this committee's leadership and other witnesses have said, local zoning rules needlessly increase the cost of housing for millions of Americans. Second, a federal grant program targeted at the right localities can help alleviate these problems. And third, a federal grant program can only succeed if funds are dispersed on the basis of housing market outcomes. To my first point on zoning and housing affordability, many local rules limit the amount of housing that can be built and increase the cost of housing that is permitted. These rules are typically codified in a municipality's zoning code. They include apartment bans, requirements that each new house sit on a lar lo large lot, and minimum lot size, and minimum parking requirements, excuse me. Such rules increase the cost of building housing, particularly in places where land is expensive. Under current zoning policies, half of American renters are rent burdened. For many families, there is too little left for other necessities once rent is paid. The percentage of renters who are rent burdened has increased over the past decades, reflecting the rising cost of exclusionary zoning. To my second point on the importance of targeting the right jurisdictions for reform, members of Congress from both parties have introduced bills in the House and Senate intended to reduce exclusionary zoning, reflecting a growing bipartisan consensus on the need for land use reform. Several proposals to date would target reform among CDBG grantees. Unfortunately, CDBGs do not reach all of the localities that enforce zoning codes. In particular, many suburbs in high wage regions where reform is most urgently needed are not entitlement communities. In order to effectively encourage zoning reform, any new program Congress considers creating should include all of the localities that enforce zoning rules as eligible grantees. And now my final point on the importance of rewarding jurisdictions based on housing market outcomes. A successful zoning reform program must reward localities for the right outcomes, namely permitting abundant housing construction. A proposal recently considered by this committee would instead fund planning exercises for potential reforms to exclusionary zoning. Sadly, past experience shows that plans to improve housing affordability often sit on local government shelves without actually leading to any zoning changes or to new housing. Other recent proposals in Congress would instead reward localities for ad adopting specific policies intended to improve housing affordability such as increasing the amount of land where multifamily housing could be permitted or reducing parking requirements. Though this approach is better, it still does not necessarily reward localities for actually making more housing feasible to build if, as often happens, localities make housing that appears legal to build on paper difficult to build in practice. Instead of rewarding localities for promising to permit more housing eventually, or for adopting policies that may not result in more housing construction on the ground, Congress could instead adopt a competitive grant program that ranks localities according to their housing market outcomes. Such a program would reward growth with the most exclusionary localities receiving nothing. My colleague and I have developed one formula that could enable such a program by ranking high demand localities primarily according to their rate of housing construction and lower demand localities primarily according to the prices of their new construction. In conclusion, the particulars of a grant program intended to encourage zoning reform would need to be debated, 
but a successful program must reward the correct metric in the correct jurisdictions, actual housing market outcomes in the localities that enforce zoning rules. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank, thank you, Ms. Hamilton, and thank, uh, I'd like to thank all the witnesses. Uh, we will begin the, the dialogical part of our hearing, and we'll begin with questions uh, from our distinguished chairwoman, Maxine Waters. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I do have a, a question for Professor Cashin. Your recent book, White Space Black Hood, focuses on black white residential segregation. And when it comes to exclusionary zoning, should the focus be broader to include, for example, economic class and other racial and ethnic, ethnic groups who are disproportionately locked out of housing opportunities? In many communities, the U.S. census racial distinction of other has been growing over the years and the residential I think I got the essence of the chairwoman's question. If you'd like me to address what I heard, uh, let's let's wait just a second or two. Just to uh, she froze, and so maybe we can uh, maybe they'll get it on. I want to make sure she can hear your response if if, if possible. Well, we can we can move on and uh, come back. Why don't you, if you will, just oh. all right. Uh, they can see you, but they can hear you. Why can't they hear me? We can now. Oh, thank you, thank you, Professor Cashin. I don't know if you heard my question. Let me give it to you again. Thank you. Okay, your recent book, White Space, Black Hood, focuses on black and white residential segregation. But when it comes to exclusionary zoning, should the focus be broader to include, for example, economic class and other racial and ethnic groups who are disproportionately locked out of housing opportunities? In many communities, the U.S. racial, the census, racial distinction of other has been growing over the years. And the residential segregation between white individuals and those who racially identify as other has also been growing. What does this tell us about modern trends in residential segregation and how policymakers should be viewing these issues? So the short answer is, am I, am I on? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. yes. The short answer, Madam Chairwoman, is yes. Um, all groups can and should benefit from disrupting exclusionary zoning and putting serious pressure, particularly on high opportunity neighborhoods to adopt inclusionary zoning ordinances where they actually build their fair share of affordable housing. But you know, the title of my book and my analysis really underscores that the residential system of separate and unequal neighborhoods that we have was born of a anti-Black prejudice, born of um, containing the 6 million and more great migrants who left the South. And so it took seven decades to create this structure, heavily sponsored and initiated by the federal government. The containment of black people is why we have, and the, and the fear of black people is why we created, and frankly, why we, we have persistent residential segregation. And I think we just have to be honest in acknowledging that, acknowledging that history, acknowledging what we're up against in trying to disrupt it. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I had a conversation recently uh, with uh, a member of Congress I have a big housing bill inside the reconciliation bill. And in that, uh, I have uh, designated a significant amount of money for vouchers. And he said, well, you should, um, you should not have that much money for vouchers because they can't spend them. Uh, there are not enough places uh, for them to even acquire. 
And so you should reduce the amount. I said, no, we're going to build more affordable housing in the National Housing Trust Fund. Uh, and so what we're basically facing, I think, is where are they going to be able to build this additional housing because of what we're talking about here today? And I think I've targeted about $36 billion for the National Housing Trust Fund in order to build more affordable units. But the question becomes, are we going to be stymied in our efforts to build more affordable housing because of this residential uh, zoning discrimination? Well, God bless you. I, I hope you prevail, Madam. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm listening to you very carefully and you're absolutely right. The government created this discrimination and we have the opportunity to undo it. And it's gonna take courage and it's gonna take pressure on the locals and all of the homeowner associations that organize around making sure uh, that, that they are exercising NIMBY, not in my backyard. And so it's going to be a lot of work. And of course, we're going to be accused of trying to disregard uh, residential neighborhoods where people have invested and that all of these people coming in from outside, people that don't look like us just cannot come to our neighborhoods. And so I tell you, when you're in these fights, then the, they turn the tables on you and us and they call us racist. And so it's going to be a lot of work. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for all of your knowledge on this subject. I appreciate you very much. Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the chair now recognizes the distinguished uh, man, uh, gentleman from Little Rock, Arkansas, uh, Mr. Hill. Well, thank you, uh, Chairman, again, for the committee. And it's been a, it's an excellent panel with a lot of good perspective and I'm grateful uh, for everybody's uh, participation. Um, Ms. Hamilton, I was uh, very interested in your, uh, your study and your formula idea. And your, your research shows how local zoning and regulatory decisions can raise the cost of new housing that I addressed in my, my opening statement. And in the Baltimore, Washington region, for example, your research shows a price increase of 1% per year in localities that have adopted inclusionary zoning policies. Can you explain that and give us some background, please? Thank you, Ranking Member Hill. I appreciate the question. I'm not optimistic about the potential for inclusionary zoning to solve the problems of exclusionary zoning. Typically, inclusionary zoning relies on density bonuses that localities provide to developments that include below market rate units. The problem with using inclusionary zoning as a solution to exclusionary zoning is that the tool that gives these density bonuses their value is exclusionary zoning itself. Without underlying exclusionary zoning, inclusionary zoning would be a clear tax on new housing construction and taxing what we're trying to see in more abundance is not the right policy. It can never do the harms undo the harms of exclusionary zoning. And as you said, I've studied inclusionary zoning in the Baltimore, Washington region. Montgomery County, Maryland is often rightly heralded as potentially the, the greatest success of inclusionary zoning. But even there, less than 4% of the housing stock may, is made up of inclusionary zoning units. So this policy has never been uh, proven to be a tool that can provide anywhere near enough housing abundance for those households who need it. Thank you. And um, I think that's uh, a key point. How you also mentioned, uh, I think, a good point, and Congressman Cleaver and I have talked about CDB is CDBG issues before uh, the committee's considering some things there. You reference entitlement cities that are obviously get a direct CDBG allocation, but a lot of uh, suburban cities or peripheral counties to an urban area don't they typically get CDBG pass-throughs maybe from a state government, and I say maybe. Can you talk about how your formula would adapt for that, for somebody who's not an entitlement city? 
That's correct. I would argue that instead the correct universe of localities that should be eligible for a federal carrot to reform exclusionary zoning should be all of the localities that are in the building permits survey conducted by the Census Bureau and HUD. Those are all of the localities um, that currently engage in land use planning and issue building permits, whereas uh, CDBGs exclude in particular high wage mm -hmm. suburbs of high wage regions. And this problem is most acute in the Northeast. Yeah, that's something that came out in our CDBG hearing where we have this pre-1940 housing stock issue uh, that dates from the 1970s in the CDBG formula, which really doesn't reflect reality. I mean, at the time we were looking at 1930 and 1940 data uh, because we wanted to offer poor cities some ability to improve housing stock. I get that. But now we're 50 years later, and it seems to me a rule like that would absolutely uh, be prejudiced against a city like Los Angeles, for example, whose 1940 housing stock wouldn't reflect uh, one iota to its 2021 uh, housing stock. So that's very interesting. One other question I have for you in your research uh, land banks uh, that a lot of cities and trying to revitalize urban areas. What cities do you think do a good job in getting um, positive practices to bring new uh, developers, new users of land bank properties in an urban area? Do you have a city in mind that uh, has done a good job there? Uh, that's not my favorite approach. Instead, I'd, I'd highlight um, localities that have engaged with exclusionary zoning across broader areas of, of land. Uh, for example, Seattle's uh, urban villages approach to upzoning or minimum lot sizes in Houston. Thank you. Good. Thank you so much. That was very interesting and I appreciate all of our panelists and uh, Mr. Cleaver, I yield back to you. And again, I have to put in my word for no more online hearings. We were disrupted listening to our leader uh, and the Gary Gensler hearing was a disaster and the markup was challenging. So I want to urge my colleagues to support going back to in-person uh, hearings. Thank you so much and I yield back. Thank you, uh, Ranking Member uh, Hill. Uh, the chair now recognizes the esteemed uh, representative from New York, Mrs. Velasquez. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, and thank you for holding this uh, important hearing on exclusionary um, zoning. Uh, my first question I would like to address to, to Mr. Silverstein. So residents and homeowners in the neighborhood of East New York uh, that I represent have been working with community-based organizations uh, to form a community land trust. First, can you explain how community land, land trusts enable local residents to take ownership of buildings and homes in order to keep their neighborhoods um, affordable? And second, can you please explain the importance of having community land trusts in place prior to any upzoning to mitigate the risk of speculation and gentrification? Thank you, Congresswoman Velasquez. Um, so uh, community land trusts are a critical tool for producing and uh, preserving long-term affordable housing. So in a community land trust, typically for a period, uh, the land is owned by the community land trust, which is an entity itself, usually a nonprofit, and um, subject to a 99-year ground lease, um, individual units, um, which could be apartments or they could be single family homes. It can vary based on the context, uh, would be occupied by residents and uh, subject to affordability restrictions. And this 99 year ground lease structure um, can allow for the gradual accumulation of some uh, home equity by residents um, so that wealth is built, but it also doesn't allow for unlimited uh, um, accumulation um, in order to guard against speculation and rapidly increasing housing costs. Um, and actually the reconcili the housing house financial services uh, markup for the Build Back Better reconciliation bill includes significant funding for community land trusts. Um, when you have um, 
zoning proposals to increase density in low-income communities of color um, in a localized way, not as, as in either as a localized way or part of a broader based uh, rezoning plan, um, you can, um, as a intended or unintended consequence, um, rapidly increase land values and home values in that neighborhood running the risk of displacement. That's part of why it's important to prioritize these upzoning efforts in higher income areas. Um, but if land is placed in a community land trust prior to uh, rezoning, um, then that 99 year ground lease structure provides a check against uh, speculation and rapidly increasing prices so that longtime community residents have the opportunity to benefit in the new investments that may be made in their communities, especially in places like East New York. Okay, great. Thank you. And how can we here at the federal level help encourage more communities and neighborhoods uh, to form community land trusts? Absolutely. Thank you, Congressman Velasquez. So I think there are a few key pieces. So the first piece is, is funding. Certainly additional funding for community land trusts is vital to the effort to grow a community, community land trust model um, as well. And I'm not an expert on this issue in particular, um, but through um, the GSEs and FHA, um, there may be some financing barriers that are um, more difficult for community land trust or other shared equity models to navigate than for more traditional types of affordable housing. So um, making it easier for community land trusts to access financing. And then also there's the question of the availability of land. So um, encouraging uh, local governments to, for instance, deed uh, tax foreclosed properties or other surplus land to a community land trust would be an important step to take as well. And then, of course, as is consistent with the subject of this whole hearing, um, you need the zoning to be appropriate for the type of housing or housing and even some small business development uh, mm -hmm. that the community land trust is seeking to engage in. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentlewoman yields back. The chair now recognizes the distinguished member, uh, Mr. Posey, you're now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for holding this hearing. To say yes. I'm very disappointed to hear one of our witnesses uh, stereotype and blame realtors for creating the problem uh, by steering is offensive and not accurate. Realtors, uh, which I am one, I adhere to a very strict code of ethics, very strong code of ethics. They don't do that, or they're not realtors. I ask uh, witness that statement if she'd like to communicate with me offline uh, to provide me with some evidence of steering that, that she claims is caused by realtors. Uh, Dr. Hamilton, I really like your concept of rankings. Uh, how would you rate programs that provide incentives for affordable housing within low to moderate income neighborhoods compared to those programs that relying on zoning reform and relocating families to new neighborhoods. Representative Posey, thank you for the question. I'd argue that both pieces are important. On the one hand, exclusionary zoning reform is the first step toward allowing more abundant, lower cost housing to be built. But on the other, that's not a sufficient uh, policy to help the country's lowest income households in the near term in particular. So I think certainly subsidies uh, to those lowest income households that can be used in those households, neighborhoods of choice are appropriate. Uh, but I would uh, err on the side of, of granting beneficiaries the most freedom in, in determining where they would like to live that both best meets their own needs uh, and pointing out that any subsidies will go further in, uh, in localities where exclusionary zoning is not a serious burden relative to those localities where it is. Very good. Thank you. Now, what should our priorities be if we want to have the most impact on accessibility to affordable 
Well, the, the barriers to housing construction vary widely across the country. In a dense old city, the, the most important barriers are very different than in a fast growing suburb. But across the country as a whole, I'd argue that minimum lot size reform is the most important reform to permitting more lower cost housing to be built quickly. Uh, parts of the country have lot size reforms that are severely out of line with, with what the market is currently providing. Um, in New England in particular, it's not uncommon to see two or even five acre lot size requirements. Okay, you know, most simply put, uh, making housing more affordable depends on lowering the cost of constructing new housing. That's right. You know, market prices of housing are determined at the new housing margin of the market. What should we do to reduce the cost of, of building new and single family housing? Well, most importantly, addressing the regulatory barriers that uh, without doing so, more federal funding will simply increase the cost of uh, the existing housing stock without permitting that funding, as well as uh, private funding to housing to, um, to go toward lower cost and more abundant housing supply. We all want to assess the accessibility, especially low to moderate income families. Uh, tell us what your research suggests are the best strategies to make affordable housing available to the lowest. Well, I've mentioned Houston as a potential model earlier. No locality in the U.S. does everything right uh, in, in land use regulation, I would argue. But Houston has a lot of lessons to teach other localities. They're widely recognized for permitting abundant greenfield development, which is true. But additionally, Houston permits multifamily housing at a high rate. It has um, no areas of the city where local regulations prevent multifamily housing. And its minimum lot size reform that I mentioned earlier has resulted in the construction of tens of thousands of new townhouses, relatively affordable relative to single family development in some of its highest demand neighborhoods. Well, listen, thank you. I, I, I really appreciate your detailed answers, and I see my time is about to expire, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you again. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the esteemed a member from uh, Houston, Mr. Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to be heard, and uh, I do live in Houston, and uh, we do not have zoning in Houston, Texas. And while that can benefit a good many people, it also has a downside to it. I happen to have um, had the opportunity to serve as a judge of a justice small claims court. And we've had persons who have had, unfortunately, uh, structures erected on property near their homes that was not suitable. And when you don't have zoning, uh, you then have restricted covenants. And getting those covenants enforced can be quite challenging, especially for a person with a modest income. Uh, so I'm interested in uh, hearing from uh, some of our panelists about uh, these restricted covenants that uh, are not enforceable. And I'm talking about those that can benefit uh, a person, if you have one, uh, in good many places, the covenants are not enforceable because they've not been honored over the years. And as a result, you can't enforce the covenant. So who'd like to be the first to say a word about this problem that we have when we don't have zoning and we cannot enforce covenants uh, because of a lapse of activity over years? Representative Green, I'll, I'll offer a brief answer since I've mentioned Houston. Certainly Houston has seen the emergence of restrictive covenants, particularly in its single family neighborhoods in the absence of local zoning. Uh, certainly zoning does have benefits for those who don't want to see change in their neighborhoods as land prices rise and demand for in, um, housing increases as well. 
I'd argue though that these uh, benefits of zoning are outweighed by zoning's costs in terms of housing affordability and opportunities for people to live in the neighborhood or region of their choice. You mentioned lot size, uh, and uh, you mentioned that in Houston we we have uh, done well with lot sizes. Uh, since I live here, I, I guess my uh, my best evidence would be my experiences and what I've seen. Uh, explain to me what you mean by the lot sizes in Houston, because I I see still large acreage for single homes. Thank you, Representative. In 1998, Houston reduced the minimum lot size for uh, for development within its I-610 inner loop from 5,000 square feet down to 3,500 square feet, and in some cases down to 1,400 square feet when specific uh, requirements are met. And this has resulted in the construction of detached and attached townhouses in many of, of the city's neighborhoods, particularly those neighborhoods closest to um, downtown job centers. This has uh, helped provide a lower cost type of housing construction relative to large lot single family development. Private covenants may remain a barrier to townhouse construction in, in plenty of parts of the city, but the reform that local policymakers implemented has nonetheless resulted in the construction of tens of thousands of new units that would have been uh, impossible to build otherwise. Uh, since I have a bit of time left and we've had a lot of excellent questions, I'm going to go a little bit off line with this question. Um, I see a lot of people just outside my window in my congressional office who've made their home the overpass. Um, there are efforts afoot to relocate, relocate people from the overpasses, and there's always a movement to place them in a certain area, if at all possible. What, what have you seen across the country in terms of helping people to move from the overpasses uh, to some place that we would call a home. How did, how is that working? Ms. Hamilton. Uh, thank you again, Representative. Uh, well, I'd argue that, um, oh, I'd point out that homelessness is not highest in the parts of the country where poverty is highest. It's instead highest in parts of the country where exclusionary zoning rules are most binding. Subsidies and uh, other interventions for homeless individuals are needed to help them in the near term. But again, zoning is a relevant component. Thank you. I, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes uh, the gentleman, Mr. Style. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman. I appreciate everybody uh, being on uh, on the on the call and on the hearing here today. Um, I think we've had a lot of good dialogue here about what's really driving uh, up the cost and how we get Americans into housing, and in particular, what the role of zoning is uh, in adjusting these costs. We see often uh, some of our biggest cities, uh, Democratic controlled cities uh, across the United States have really strict uh, zoning rules and regulations uh, that seem to be driving up the cost. And I think it's something that we don't spend enough time looking at and thinking about when you look at the cost of housing in New York City Los Angeles, and what the role of local uh, regulation is on this, and what the role of this demand side uh, subsidies would have uh, inside the overall cost of housing in the context of not really addressing the supply side issue uh, in many of our nation's largest cities. Again, in particular, uh, New York City and Los Angeles, which both have uh, supply side constraints on housing, often through local zoning requirements, uh, coupled with uh, some of the highest housing costs in the United States of America. And so if I can ask you, uh, Ms. Hamilton, um, you know, as you may know, the majority has passed about $300 billion in new housing spending uh, through this committee, uh, and most of the money would go towards demand side uh, subsidies. And based on uh, today's conversation, it seems pretty clear uh, that the core problem that we're facing in the market is really the supply side 
issue. In many places, supply is tight and limited by overbearing regulations uh, that the housing development um, that makes this housing development uneconomical uh, or in some cases actually impossible. Could you give us some color as to what would happen if the federal government just throws billions and billions of dollars more into the market on the demand side uh, with limited supply? Thank you, Representative Style. Certainly, that's a, a very real concern about expanding current federal housing subsidies, is that in particularly the most exclusionary regions, those subsidies will simply increase the cost of a relatively fixed stock of housing, rather than leading to overall abundance and the opportunity for more people to live in the location of their choice. There are examples where we see federal subsidies working well, leading to the construction of low-cost multifamily housing for whom those um, the beneficiaries are intended to benefit. And that's a, a positive outcome, but it's not the norm due to um, local exclusionary zoning rules. Let, uh, and let it's me, not let, Ms. Ms. Hamilton, I can't, so the, this format is just terrible. I can't wait till we're in person again uh, for all of our hearings. But let me, let me dive in on that because I think what you're, what you're bringing up is really important because uh, if there's a, a great study out there from 2018 uh, that shows that regulations can add up to $93,000 of costs on a home uh, where a single family home price uh, is now maybe just under uh, $400,000 uh, in the median. And effectively, all of these regulations and zoning function almost as like a new tax on new housing, which moves us in the wrong direction. And one of the things I don't think we discuss enough is who's footing the bill for this, right? Is are certain groups uniquely impacted by what I call nimbyism of all of these uh, local zoning and rules and regulations? Yes, low income households are those who are most burdened with the cost of exclusionary zonings. And uh, to the extent that additional subsidies will increase the price of market rate housing, which is what the vast majority of Americans of all income levels live in. Additional so, so subsidies. It, so, so, so is it fair to say, so some of our biggest democratic run cities that are putting in all of these regulations and controlling the supply are actually clobbering the low income households. That's your take on this? Certainly. Yeah, it's mine too. It's one of the big frustrations that I have here is we only look at increasing uh, demand side money, spending taxpayer dollars from all across the nation and really not addressing the supply side issue in some of our biggest democratic run cities. You share that frustration, it sounds like, Ms. Hamilton. I do. Thank you. Yeah, could you maybe just add a little more color in particular on, on what we could be doing on the zoning side as it relates to this government funding, if you would? I would support a flexible grant program that gives a local policymakers a wide freedom in what they spend the grant money on that's nonetheless defensible purposes, because the purpose of these grants is to encourage regulatory reform, not to fund specific programmatic outcomes. Uh, I, I appreciate that. Cognizant of my time, I appreciate your time, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you holding today's hearing, and I will yield back. Thank, thank the gentleman for his questions. Uh, let, let me just make a, a correction, at, uh, just for the record. Uh, in 2019, uh, Newsday published uh, the Long Island Divided series. It was uh, an exhaustive three-year uh, investigation into racial discrimination and home buying on uh, Long Island. And uh, they deployed actors to conduct fair uh, lending testing, which involved the use of hidden cameras. Many of you may have seen this on TV. Uh, they recorded meetings with real estate agents. And this is one of the, the, the many fair housing testing investigations. And it, and it confirmed long-standing finding over the decades uh, showing that uh, in nearly a quarter of the tests, 24% agents directed whites and minorities into different communities through house listings, that had the earmarks of steering. Uh, now the unlawful sorting of home buyers based on race of, of ethnicity, that, that's a direct quote. Uh, the, the chair now uh, recognizes uh, the eminent uh, representative from Ohio, Ms. Beatty. Uh, 
First of all, let me say um, good afternoon and thank you, uh, Chairman Cleaver. Thank you, Chair. And ranking member here. Uh, my first question is for Ms. Casson. Uh, historically, zoning has been used by city and, and local governments as a tool to segregate Americans. And that segregation got us into parts of towns that were known as black neighborhoods or wealthy neighborhoods or even Jewish neighborhoods and et cetera. Uh, remnants of racial and ethnic discrimination persist in cities today and communities all around the country. And that's what we're hearing today. And from these discriminatory zoning and segregation policies of the past, the Civil Rights Act has outlawed intentional discrimination, but how do our current zoning policies and other local housing ordinances remain a tool for discrimination and segregation in your opinion? Well, th thank you, uh, Congresswoman, for that question. Um, it, racial exclusionary zoning was struck down by the Supreme Court. So obviously, uh, even though many exclusionary zoning ordinances, when they were passed, were animated by anti-Black prejudice and continue to be, um, they use racially neutral tools to exclude people who cannot buy very expensive, large lot, large homes. You you can you can zone, particularly in in newer communities, um, only for large lot, expensive housing. You can require certain types of materials. Um, you can have no um, nothing in your zoning code that um, it provides for multifamily living. You know, not even market rate apartments. Right, um, and so and now all of these ostensibly racially neutral things disproportionately exclude people of color. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Silverstein, while zoning reform and redevelopment can expand housing opportunities for low and, and middle income Americans, if the right safeguards are not in place and the right incentives are not in place, it can exacerbate the lack of affordable housing and, and lead to gentrification. What are some of the ways that the federal and, and local government ensure by affordable housing instead of building more luxury condos like we're seeing in D.C. and, and here in uh, Columbus, Ohio. Uh, absolutely. Thank you for the question, Congresswoman Beatty. So um, I think there are, there are a few pieces of this. So to the extent that localities are taking on zoning reform specifically in response to federal incentives or, or requirements, and Congress is designing those federal incentives and requirements, um, it should be clearly baked in that the purpose of the zoning reform is to increase the supply of deed restricted affordable housing. That does not mean that there wouldn't be any market rate housing, which some of which may be luxury housing produced as a result. In addition, in the context of a mixed income development, um, there's certainly a place for that. And those market rate units can help cross subsidize affordable housing units in addition to being paired with subsidy. Um, but basically, at the level of policy design, you absolutely want to make sure that your overriding purpose is on creating more affordable housing. Uh, <clears throat> secondly, uh, there's an enforcement side to this. If a jurisdiction is um, engaging in targeted upzoning that is, that is predictable, is likely to cause displacement, that just as much as exclusionary zoning raises questions about Fair Housing Act compliance and HUD and DOJ have an enforcement role to play in looking at those types of practices. Um, and certainly that's something uh, that I think- you I have to interrupt because of my, time. Mm -hmm. my time is almost up. So mm -hmm. I, I get the gist of it. I yeah. wanna thank you because for the record, uh, I do wanna enter this Mr. Uh, Chairman, that as mm -hmm. we look at Bill back better in light of what most of the folks who have said, who have testified, and also from the questions from my colleagues on both sides of the aisle. A lot of this confirms what Chairwoman Waters has been saying. We need to make sure that as a top priority, housing is well funded in these packages that we're going back on the floor and we're voting for. 
We must not cut those dollars. We must include housing at the highest amount in both our bills when we come back on reconciliation and infrastructure. Thank you, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back, and now the chair recognizes the notable uh, Mr. John Rose. You have five minutes. Sorry about that. I hit the wrong button. Chairman Cleaver, uh, Ranking Member Hill, thank you for holding this hearing and thank you to our witnesses for your time and expertise uh, this Friday afternoon. The supply of homes for sale at the end of August 2021 totaled 1.29 million units, down 1.5% from July and down 13.4% from August of last year, according to the National Association of Realtors. Housing supply is failing to keep up with the demand and it is resulting in dramatically higher prices for homes. Therefore, it is critical that we have affordable housing options for families across the nation. In Tennessee's sixth congressional district, which I represent, 12.9% of total occupied housing units are manufactured homes. Manufactured housing is the most affordable home ownership option available nationwide for minorities, underserved, and low income borrowers. According to the U.S. Census data, 90% of new homes, 90% of new homes under 75,000 are manufactured housing. Dr. Hamilton, many cities and towns ban manufactured homes as a permitted use in residential zones and relegate them into a special overlay zone in one small area of the community. This often eliminates affordable home ownership in areas of opportunity in that community. At the federal level, how can we encourage communities to expand zoning, including manufactured homes, to increase affordability, especially in areas of opportunity near good paying jobs, high quality schools, and other amenities? Thank you, Representative Rose. I certainly agree on the importance of manufactured homes as one piece of the solution to permitting abundant, low-cost housing. Uh, some states have taken an approach of requiring their localities to uh, permit manufactured homes uh, on all residential lots across the state, Nebraska being one example. But I would argue that state policy or federal policy intended to increase the availability of manufactured homes needs to go further, addressing rules like minimum lot size requirements that make manufactured homes often not make sense uh, when the differential between the lot and the cost of the house is uh, too large to be a, a logical market outcome. You mentioned the, the size of the lot, and I, uh, I want to ask a follow-up question, but let me stay on point here for a second. Statute requires HUD, when allocating grant money like CDBG or HOME, H-O-M-E, uh, to communities to ensure uh, those communities have manufactured housing considered as part of their affordable housing plans. HUD has not utilized this part of the law, and many communities exclude uh, manufactured housing in their zoning plans. This eliminates a potential rich source of affordable home ownership from many parts of the country. How can HUD compel communities to include manufactured housing in their comprehensive housing plans? Well, HUD could, could certainly uh, go further to act on that language, but I'd argue that real change must come from Congress and members of this committee um, changing the statutes that HUD works with to provide them with more teeth to um, compel local zoning reform. Very good. I, I mentioned I want to uh, get your opinion on a situation that we see a lot of people moving to Tennessee from higher cost areas like California and the Northeast. And one of the land use planning issues that's uh, maybe particular to Tennessee, although maybe other rural states face this, and that is that in Tennessee, you can avoid local um, planning commissions if the lot sizes that you subdivide property into are five acres or larger. Uh, Tennessee has another curiosity that they require, though, a 50 foot access strip to a public road. And so it creates a situation where we're seeing some very uh, difficult subdivisions happening where you have these 50-foot strips 
making their way back into larger tracts of property. Have you seen that problem? And what are your opinions about the long-term implications of this land that's divided into these very narrow strips for access purposes and for purely meeting the, the zoning requirements? Representative, that's an excellent example of the interaction of, uh, of the many regulations that local governments enforce, sometimes leading to uh, outcomes that, that just don't make sense and constrain housing construction as a result. Uh, so that's why I'd focus on rewarding housing market outcomes rather than specific policy changes. Thank you. I see that my time's expired. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, gentleman yields. Uh, the chair now recognizes the celebrated a member from California, Mr. Vargas. Yeah, well, five minutes, thank, you. thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I love to celebrate any party. We celebrate. And I want to thank you and the ranking member, Mr. French Hill, good friend, and especially the chairwoman, Ms. Maxine Waters, because I think that this is a very, very important issue, housing, affordability of housing. But it's also a very complicated one, just to be frank. I was on the San Diego City Council for about seven years, and I sat on two committees mostly. That was the Public Safety Committee and the Land Use and Housing Committee. And on the Land Use and Housing Committee, uh, you know, I, I got to know a little bit about San Diego and how it's built. You know, our every city's different, but basically we're constrained by you can't go south because it's a different country. It's Mexico. You, you can't go west because it's the ocean. East, interestingly, you bump into mountains and it's very difficult and expensive to build into mountains. And going north, you hit Camp Pendleton, which is a military base, and, and we like it and we don't want to change that. Um, we need to train our Marines there. So you're really constrained in this area. And so almost all of the avail available land for uh, development is used. Now you have to have density. I think density is very, very important. That's where, of course, zoning comes in. But we've had some experiments here that have gone very badly. For example, I think everyone tried to do the right thing back in the 1960s and said, the center part of the city, um, an, an area that was a little bit older with housing that was over 50 years old, we're gonna allow for the change in zoning and allow up to six units in a single family uh, neighborhood. And of course, they thought it'd be a great idea because it's fairly close to the downtown. There was transportation corridors there. There was also housing. I mean, not housing, but there, well, housing was dilapidated. It was, it was, it needed some change because of the 50, 50 years old. But they, they thought it was a good idea. What happened, happened was instead, you got a lot of um, people that came in and did what they call the Huffman six pack. They bought the single family house. They basically scraped it and they built the ugliest possible square box with six units there they had no uh in the front instead of having grass and a place to park it was all cement and just simply parked your car and it destroyed those neighborhoods it, it really did now i was on the public safety committee and i could tell you that most of the problems that we had in those neighborhoods with crime came out of those huffman six packs so they changed the zoning again not to allow that which was too bad because I think it really was the character of what they built, not the, not the density, but what they built. They built it as cheaply and as badly as they possibly could just to squeeze money out of it. Now we're, we're building in areas with much more density than that, much more than six units, and it's done right. They don't just scrape the front yard. You had one area, you park underneath the building, you go up you know, a number of spaces, but that's more expensive to build like that but it is, it is a better building. Anyway, I mentioned that because it's not so easy just to simply change. And I don't, and it's not always racism either. Interestingly, in this neighborhood, most of the people are people of color. So they're not against people of color moving in, just saying, you know, don't build like they built before those Huffman six pack. It's destroyed the neighborhood. I mean, does anyone have a comment on that? Because again, I, I believe in density. I think density is good, but you can't just build the crappiest possible building there because I think it does destroy those neighborhoods. Uh, how about um, Professor Cashin? Any comment on that? Yeah. So can you hear me? Yes, okay. absolutely. So part of the reason why I support strongly encouraging communities to adopt their own inclusionary zoning ordinance is it can be tailored to their individual circumstances. Um, 
you know, and, and, and the process of doing that, hopefully, you know, all the constituencies in this, in the community get to participate in shaping what that looks like. It's not for the federal government to, 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 to say what it should look like. But the point is that communities and yes, um, including a lot of Democrat run cities need to get going on a vision of inclusion where people of all colors, races, and economic circumstances can live together uh, more densely and more affordably. I, I love the idea of letting more, you know, creating more micro housing, creating manufacturing, allowing manufactured housing come in, uh, but uh, strongly incentivizing, enforcing a firm of, of AFFH, putting pressure on localities to innovate and build cities and communities of the future that include and work for everyone. Yeah, I, my, my time is up. I, and I agree with you. The only thing is, I think the product is important too. what you build, because if, if you do build a crappy building, I mean, that, that does, in fact, create problems for everybody, especially if you want to create more density. And again, Vienna is one of the most dense places in the in the world. And it always is the most livable city. Density is good. Just this has to be done right. Thank you very much. Thank I, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Yields back the uh, acclaimed Floridian, uh, Mr. Lawson. You are now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you all for having this hearing. I want to uh, thank the panel uh, for being here today. It's a very important issue. Uh, in only twelve counties in America, can a full-time worker earn? state or federal minimum wage affordable afford a one bedroom home. According to this report, in no state at all can a person earning minimum wages afford a two bedroom apartment. High rent have another uh, detrimental effect. Delaying home ownership long home ownership long is similar of American and the similar of American uh, dream. In my district in Duval County in order to afford a moderate two bedroom home, a rental need to earn $18.63 an hour. That is $10.53 more than the state minimum wage and about $2 more than what the average renter in Jacksonville earn. Ms. Gala, putting the minimum wage issue aside, how can localities uh, better encourage development to increase the production of affordable units targeting extremely low income households? Thank you for the question. Um, this is the reason why demand programs are just as important as supply, because the income level for many communities is exactly as you quoted in the GAP report from the National Low Income Housing Coalition, which many of us read and, and assess and develop programs from and recommend policies to. Supply and demand are both complicated issues and you cannot address one without the other. What you're referring to when people's incomes are so low, there has to be programs to provide opportunities for people to pay just 30% of their income for rent. So the voucher program is critically important. At the same time, there needs to be programs to increase the production of housing so that supply is not so constrained that the cost continues to go up. And that's where I think one of the members talked about billions of dollars going to construction is absolutely necessary. The low income housing tax credit program is one very key program that can facilitate the development of affordable housing for people with extremely low income housing level. In fact, over its history, it's developed over three millions, I think it was three million units uh, across the country. So I would encourage the, um, the members of Congress to continue to pay attention to those programs. There are various proposals before you that would increase um, the allocation of tax credits to develop extremely low income housing and and then keep the focus on the housing voucher program and being able to provide those universally to everyone who needs it. Okay, thank you very much. As a follow up, uh, Mr. Silverstein uh, Stein, can zoning reform alone resolve affordability and, and, and equity concerns? Thank you, Congressman Lawson. Uh, no, zoning reform on its own cannot resolve the affordability crisis and certainly can't do so in a way um, that centers racial equity. Um, zoning reform is one critical piece of a broader strategy, uh, 
Um, it has to be strategic and targeted in how zoning reform is crafted, and then it also has to be paired um, with actual investments in subsidized housing, um, such as those included in the Build Back Better reconciliation package. Um, and I would say quickly on one point, um, the investment in housing choice vouchers um, is not strictly speaking just a demand side measure. Most new affordable housing that is uh, built to reach extremely low income households um, includes housing choice vouchers that have been project based. So I don't think that we should buy into a strict dichotomy between housing choice vouchers as a demand side uh, program and the other investments as being supply side. They, uh, housing choice vouchers can, can play on both sides of that line. Okay, with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The, the uh, gentleman uh, yields back. Uh, the chair now recognizes the notable New Yorker, Mr. Torres. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the United States has been and continues to be zoned for segregation. Exclusionary zoning produces and perpetuates housing segregation by race and class, which in turn produces and perpetuates school segregation by race and class. Ours is a nation that preaches equal opportunity, but often practices segregation. And the research of Professor Raj Chetty has persuasively shown that zip code is often destiny and that where you live often determines your opportunity and mobility. My first question is about one of the most egregious forms of exclusionary zoning, single family zoning. And this question is for Cheryl Cashin and Thomas Silverstein. And it's a yes or no question. Is single family zoning a violation of the Fair Housing Act? Woo. Uh I'm going to say yes. I would have to explain why, but I'm going to say yes and, and leave you your time, sir. <laughs> Mr. Silverstein, your opinion? Um, I'm going to say often, and I would have to explain why. Okay. Um, Ms. Dr. Watson, your testimony and your exchange with Congressman Stahl, in my opinion, set up a false choice between housing supply and housing subsidy. Um, it's not an either or proposition. We need greater housing supply to ensure sufficient quantity of housing, and we need greater housing subsidy to ensure sufficient affordability of housing. Uh, the Build Back Better Act envisions a historic expansion of Section 8 vouchers, which would make affordable housing units that would otherwise be unaffordable to the lowest income Americans. So we disagree on the question of housing subsidy, but I have a question regarding housing supply. You've spoken about the need for land use reform through incentives. Um, I'm admittedly skeptical about the effectiveness of incentives. It seems to me that an exclusive community that is determined to remain exclusive is unlikely to be swayed by incentives. So what reason is to what reason is there to think that incentives would be effective at effectuating the kind of land use reform necessary for addressing the affordability crisis? Sorry, is that question for me? Yes. Thank you, Representative. Uh, I agree that uh, incentives are um, not sufficient to encourage local zoning reform, particularly because the problem is most severe in high um, tax base localities where these federal grants are going to be least effective. For that reason, I think any program that does use incentives must be designed um, as uh, as in order to be as effective as possible. Um, and recognizing that ultimately reforms must come from the local or state levels in some cases, rather than relying on the federal purse strings. It seems to me the proper response to exclusionary zoning is not incentives, but the proper response is a robust enforcement of the Fair Housing Act. Um, I have a question for Mr. Kallenberg. Um, uh, I, I admire your research on, on segregation. You know, in a time of gentrification and speculation, there's an understandable concern that more development would likely lead to displacement rather than desegregation. Um, in your opinion, how do we best structure development to ensure desegregation instead of the displacement that many fear? Well, th thank you for the question, Congressman Torres. Uh, I have two, two thoughts on that issue. Um, first of all, I think there's good evidence that exclusionary zoning uh, in general causes more gentrification and displacement. Uh, that is to say when individuals are 
uh, who might purchase a home in a, um, a middle class neighborhood uh, cannot afford to because of exclusionary zoning that leads them to to choose to go into a neighborhood that's gentrifying and and thereby displace people so uh, who displace people who are living there so that's part of the issue the other is that I think we've we've learned from California and elsewhere that zoning reform that only uh, provides up zoning without protections for individuals uh, who may face displacement is is wrong and it's politically uh, unfeasible as well. And so I would uh, agree with Professor Cashin, who's emphasized the importance of inclusionary uh, measures when there is uh, is uh, an area that's being upzoned uh, and uh, and associated measures to make sure that uh, there's not expansive displacement. Is there a locality that you feel represents the right model of affordable and sustainable and equitable development? I think we're, we're still searching for that, that perfect model. Right I see my time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Torres. Uh, before I begin my questioning, I, I want to uh, place into the record a letter from the multinational uh, Housing Council uh, without objection. Uh, and this uh, letter uh, dated October 15th, 2021. Uh, I'd like to just have a little a quick conversation, uh, if I might, uh, with uh, the two of our, our witnesses, uh, Mr. Kallenberg and Ms. Gallo. Uh, you know, can, can you, in, in just a few words, uh, tell, speak, speak to me about, please, the difference between segregation uh, and gentrification. Either one, either one or both of you. Um, segregation is what we've been talking about in terms of the consequences of zoning practice throughout this country. When you are deliberately Mm -hmm. creating situations where people, particularly people of color and lower income people cannot live in certain areas and the decisions to allow that to happen are essentially sanctions from policies and, and programs. So zoning is one practice where you, you have certain people not being able to live because of, for instance, the single family zoning conversation. Gentrification happens when we attempt to, um, when we have people displaced from communities that have traditionally lived there for a long time, and it happens from the upzoning practices that are not done correctly. Um, and so gentrification is when neighborhoods um, start to change from a predominantly low income community to one that has higher prices for homes, both rental and sales, and causes the people who live there to no longer afford to live there. So that's my, my layman's definition, practicing affordable housing development. Yeah. Go ahead. Mr. Kallenberg. Mr. Kallenberg, are you still with us? Uh, well, we, we can let's let's, let's uh, continue this if, if we will. will. Uh, you, you know, as I mentioned, I, I chaired the Plans and Zoning Committee when I was uh, on, on City Council in Kansas City, and and one of the problems I, that just drives me crazy is we have a historic uh, West Side, which has been a, a primarily a Hispanic uh, area for 100, 100 years. In fact, we have a, a Hispanic Community Center, the Guadalupe Center, that's been there for one hundred years. But all of a sudden, most Hispanics uh, cannot live there anymore because uh, of what has happened with the gentrification. Uh, and uh, you know, only the, the only the long timers can afford to still uh, live in that in that, that, that neighborhood. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I am obviously and necessarily concerned uh, that uh, you know when you look at minorities, the rate of home ownership. Uh, and com uh, comp compare black and brown homeownership with uh, 
uh, white home ownership, which is exploding at about 75%. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the Urban Institute uh, has recommended that, that policymakers create more opportunities for affordable home ownership and reform local zoning laws. Uh, you know, land use policies, we need to reform uh, building codes uh, that inhibit uh, affordable housing and development. Uh, and, and uh, you know, we, we need to create a, a means of uh, reducing the racial home ownership gap. But uh, I don't know if any of those things we did uh, can halt it. Uh, if people, uh, uh, Mr. Gall Gallenberg, are, uh, are moving in uh, and they have a, a, a significant uh, income uh, level uh, over the existing uh, residents. So uh, what is that? Is that segregation or, or financial segregation or is it gen still gentrification uh, and that uh, uh, Ms. Gallo mentioned? So I, I, I apologize, uh, Mr. Cleaver, I've been having connectivity issues, and so I'm not sure that I got all of the question, uh, but the um, uh, the question of, of uh, gentrification and displacement is, is a central one. It's, I think we're, we want to see some movement where there is, uh, uh, there are neighborhoods where there's going to be a nice uh, and healthy economic mix, um, but we have to have those protections in place to make sure that uh, there, there's not displacement, but I apologize because I didn't get I didn't get most of your question. Yeah, you, you know, uh, I, I, I get excited about some areas in Kansas City, Missouri, that are that that are now becoming diversified, that racially mixed, and uh, but uh, many of the homeowners in those areas are saying to me, uh, "Look, we're going to get priced out of here. It's just a matter of time." And, and so uh, they're saying this is going to become another segregated neighborhood. We'll, we'll have to move out of here because the people who are moving in have higher uh, incomes uh, and they're moving in rehabbing the older homes. Uh, and I'm not sure that there is a, a, a zoning law that can, get, that can touch this issue. Uh, so I, I'm, wondering, I'm looking for the, the, the housing intelligentsia uh, to, to uh, give me the solution to this issue. I, uh, I'd say, uh, you know, Philadelphia is one of the uh, leaders on this issue where they are uh, taking steps to make sure that there are supports for those who are longtime residents in the community that are that are not displaced. So that's that's one model to look at. And I would add the community land trust conversation we had earlier is something that should be pursued in areas that are facing gentrification. All right. Uh, we appreciate uh, all of the witnesses. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for providing us with, with, I think, some tremendously important uh, information. Uh, let me now recognize before I close the meeting out the uh, ranking member, Mr. Uh, Mr. Cleaver, thank you. Really interesting hearing. I thought it was excellent give and take a discussion. Thanks for holding it. I just had a quick question before we left, so since we're not able to see each other in person. We haven't had a hearing in the oversight of the secondary mortgage market, particularly Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac since December of 2018. I wanted to put that on your radar and see if you would agree with me to perhaps urge our, our committee, full committee chair that we do that. Yeah, we actually need to do that, uh, especially now there's a, a new a head of the FHFA, I think that I get those acronyms turned around a little. Uh, so I, I, I think that it would be uh, a good time for us to have that hearing. Uh, thank you. Now you back to my friend. We'll talk with you uh, about that later. I'd like to thank uh, again all of the, uh, the witnesses uh, and uh, thank the distinguished rec uh, uh, ranking member. Uh, without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. I ask all of the uh, witnesses to please respond as, as promptly as you're able. Uh, without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. I remind members that written questions and materials for the record should be submitted to email address provided to your offices. 
If there are no other uh, questions or important people coming forth, the eminent members of Congress uh, are now dismissed for lunch. This meeting is now adjourned.